nice to see you, man. <clears throat> it's nice to see you too, Carolyn. But <laughs> that's a given, right? She. <laughs> <laughs> oh man well good morning it is great to be up in Ocala it's gr even better that we get to basically drive home in the rain today so uh, we're going south we're going to hit it Pastor Michael's coming more south and he's going to hit it so be praying for safety as we travel all over the place so we get to continue in our series in Ezekiel. So if you have your Bibles, you're more than welcome to turn there. Ezekiel 36 and 37 today. We get to continue in this, I mean, rather light-hearted sermon series, right? <laughs> like... If, you, if you've been here for the last seven weeks, you know, like, that's a joke. Uh, this has been exactly what it's named, Heavy Hearts. I got a text about, I don't know, I think it was three weeks ago on a Monday morning after my sermon from Lakeland got uploaded to Spotify and it was flagged for explicit. I guess they limit the amount of times you can say whore. <laughs> in a sermon, so. I was only reading the Bible, man. <laughs> so, I mean, that was, a, that was a good Monday morning joke. It was like, hey, you're the first pastor to get flagged for explicit. And it was, it was just, it was rightfully so. Like, if there was going to be a pastor that got flagged for explicit, it was going to be me, so. <clears throat> no, it was, but we have been going through it, feeling quite the opposite of lighthearted Hence the series title, Heavy Hearts. Anybody else feel the weightiness of this sermon series? I, I have, every week I've, <laughs> I've scratched my bald head and, and asked myself, why did we choose Ezekiel for the summer? <laughs> like, it's like, it, isn't the summer supposed to kick back and relax a little bit, you know? It's like, you know, well... I just want you to know that your pastors chose this for you, so next time I'll, I'll step in and interject and be like, no, nah, maybe save that for December, you know? No. So before we jump in, it's our practice to pray together. You're invited to pray along with me the disciples' prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen? It's always a good place to start. And we do have a tall order this morning because I, I, I think I understood the assignment, right? It's, we have chapters 36 and 37 to go through. Now, I remember when I did chapter, I think it was chapter 16 that got flagged. It was a fi like a 15 minute reading of, 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 of scripture. So I like, it's that's quite a long time to be reading. So we have 36 and 37 this morning, I'm going to read through the Message Bible. So if you have your phone, you can flip over there. I'm going to read through the Message Bible translation for chapter 36, okay? Just to get through there uh, with a little bit more of a precise, concise reading. And this is what I know. Because we can get lost... And in in the heaviness of it, the weightiness of it, the, the prophecy of it, this, this guy, Ezekiel, that captures this interaction between God and his people from like 2,600 years ago, right? But we can learn some pretty significant truths if we learn to like pull out these principles that we can find and allow them to dictate our faith or what our faith in God looks like. So be, just be listening for that as we read this morning. Chapter 36, starting in verse 1. 
And now, son of man, Ezekiel, prophesy to the mountains of Israel. Say, mountains of Israel, listen to God's message. God the Master says, because the enemy crowed over you, good, these old hills are now yours. Now here is a prophecy in the name of God, the Master. Because nations came at you from all sides, ripping and plundering, hauling pieces of you off every which way. And you've become the butt of cheap gossip and jokes. Therefore, mountains of Israel, listen to the message of God, the Master. My message to the mountains and hills, to ditches and valleys, to the heaps of rubble and the emptied towns that are looted for plunder and turned into jokes by all surrounding nations. Therefore, says God, the Master, now I am speaking in a fiery rage against the rest of the nations, but especially against Edom, who in an orgy of violence and shameless insolence robbed me of my land, grabbed it for themselves. Therefore, prophesy over the land of Israel, preach to the mountains and hills, to every ditch and valley, the message of God, the Master. Look, listen, I'm angry and I care. I'm speaking to you because you've been humiliated among the nations. Therefore, I, God, the Master, I'm telling you that I have solemnly sworn that the nations around you are next. It's their turn to be humiliated. But you, mountains of Israel, will burst with new growth, putting out branches and bearing fruit for my people Israel. My people are coming home. Do you see? I'm back again. I'm on your side. You'll be plowed and planted as before. I'll, I'll see to it that your population grows all over Israel, that the towns fill up with people, that the ruins are rebuilt. I'll make this place teem with life, human and animal. The country will burst into life, life and more life. Your towns and villages full of people just as in the old days. I'll treat you better than I ever have. And you'll realize that I am God. I'll put people over you, my own people Israel. They'll take care of you and you'll be their inheritance. Never again will you be harsh and unforgiving land to them. God the Master says, because you have a reputation of being a land that eats people alive and makes women barren, I'm now telling you that you'll never eat people alive again, nor make women barren. Decree of God the Master, and I'll never let the taunts of outsiders be heard over you, no permit nations to look down on you. You'll no longer be a land that makes women barren, decree of God the Master. God's message came to me, Son of man, when the people of Israel lived in their land, they polluted it by the way they lived. I poured out my anger on them because of the polluted blood they poured out on the ground. And so I got thoroughly angry with them, polluting the country with their wanton murders and dirty gods. I kicked them out, exiled them to other countries. I sentenced them according to how they lived. Wherever they went, they gave me a bad name. People said, these are God's people but they got kicked out off of his land. I suffered much pain over my holy reputation, which the people of Israel blackened in every country they entered. Therefore, tell Israel, message of God, the master, I'm not doing this for you, Israel. I'm doing it for me to save my character, my holy name, which you've blackened in every country where you've gone. I'm going to put my great and holy name on display the name that has been ruined in so many countries, the name that you have blackened wherever you went, then the nations will realize who I am, that I am God. When I show my holiness through you so that they can see it with their own eyes. For here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take you out of these countries, gather you from all over, and bring you back to your own land. Here's the promise. I'll pour pure water over you and scrub you clean. I'll give you a new heart, put a new spirit in you. I'll remove the stone heart from your body and replace it with a heart that's God-willed, not self-willed. I'll put my spirit in you and make it possible for you to do what I tell you and live by my commands. You'll once again live in the land I gave your ancestors. You'll be my people. I'll be your God. I'll pull you out of that stinking pollution. I'll give you personal orders to 
the wheat fields, telling them to grow bumper crops. I'll send more, uh, no more famines. I'll make sure your fruit trees and field crops flourish. Other nations won't be able to hold you in contempt again because of famine. And then you'll think back over your terrible lives, the evil, the shame, and be thoroughly disgusted with yourselves, realizing how badly you've lived, all those obscenities you've carried out. I'm not doing this for you. Get this through your thick heads. Shame on you. What a mess you made of things, Israel. Message of God the Master. On the day I scrub you clean from all your filthy living, I'll make you make your cities livable. The ruins will be rebuilt. The neglected lands will be working again, no longer overgrown with weeds and thistles worthless in the eyes of passerbyers. People will exclaim why this weed patch has turned into a, a Garden of Eden and the ruined cities smashed into oblivion are now thriving. The nations around you that are still in existence will realize that I, God, rebuild ruins and replant empty waste places. I, God, said so, and I'll do it. Message of God the Master. Yet again, I'm going to do what Israel asks. I'll increase their population as with a flock of sheep, like the milling flocks of sheep brought for sacrifices in Jerusalem during the appointed feasts. The ruined cities will be filled with flocks of people. And here it is, and they will realize that I am God. I think, again, just heavy words to say, hey, you, you messed up, but I'm going to deliver you. I am going to make you my people and you will be, or I will be your God. <clears throat> and the nations will realize who, who God is, who he truly is, a God of love and mercy and kindness. Chapter 37, we'll move back over to the ESV who's, that we have in our seats. So 36 is that promise, and this is going to be sort of this, this, this picture of what it looks like. The hand, starting in verse 1, the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley, full of bones. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley. And behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, Oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, And skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Verse 11. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. (laughs) You don't say. (laughs) Like God said that he was going to do this. (laughs) And it happened. (laughs) When God says he's going to do something, he's going to do it, right? Like it's going to happen. Like count, count is done. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, 
And I will put my spirit within you and you shall live. And I place you. I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it, declares the Lord. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, take a stick and write on it for Judah and the people of Israel associated with him. Then take another stick and write on it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim and all the houses of Israel associated with him. And join them one to another into one stick, that they may become one in your hands. And when your people say to you, will you not tell us what you mean by these? Say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am about to take the stick of Joseph that is in the hand of Ephraim and the tribes of Israel associated with him. And I will join with it the stick of Judah and make them one stick that they may be one in my hand. When the sticks on which you write are in your hand before your eyes, then say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will take the people of Israel from the nations among which they have gone, and I will gather them from all around and bring them to their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land, on the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king over them all, and they shall be no longer two nations, and no longer divided into two kingdoms. They shall not defile themselves anymore with their idols and their detestable things or with any of their transgressions. But I will save them from all the backslidings in which they have sinned. And I will cleanse them and they shall be my people and I will be their God. My servant David shall be the king over them and they shall all have one shepherd and they shall walk in my rules and be careful to obey my statutes. They shall dwell in the land that I have that I gave my servant Jacob where your fathers lived. They and their children and their children's children shall dwell there forever. And David, my servant, shall be their prince forever. And I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will set them in their land and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in the midst forevermore. My dwelling place shall be with them and I will be their God and they shall be my people then the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. And let's all get home before the storm comes. Right? (laughs) Despite the lack of effort on God's chosen people, who would do the work to fulfill the promises? Who would do the work? God will, right? Right? God would. And why would he go to such extreme measures to allow the judgment of his people, the the destruction of their land, the, the scattering of his people all over the place so that one day he would and could restore them and he would once again be their God and they would be his people and that everyone who played witness to this whole thing without a shadow of a doubt, would know that he is the Lord who sanctifies the people Israel. He will go at great lengths, <laughs> at great lengths to make a point. You ever known that? Like God will go to great lengths to make a point. There's the promise. So let's work through the, the picture found in Ezekiel's vision of this valley of dry bones. So this morning I have five points, that's it. And they're pretty short, so if you, if you write things down, it's pretty, it should be pretty easy to get through. And this is five points that we can glean from this prophecy to the Jewish people who were in, still in captivity in Babylon. The temple had already been destroyed. So point number one that we can glean from this is that our position is planned by God. That's in verse 1 of chapter 37. Our position is planned by God. The place where you are is where the God of the universe has positioned you to be in. You hear that? The place where you are is where the God of the universe has placed you. Even if those places look daunting Trust that he has you there on purpose. And when it 
comes to position. Position is the place where you live. It's the, it's the place in which you work at. It's, it's the grocery store in, that you shop in. It's the restaurant that you'll go to, right? Position is at your doctor's office for a checkup or getting tough results. It's, it's sitting in a hospital waiting room as you're waiting on a loved one as they're in surgery. God has you there on purpose. It's the living room where you sit with your kids as you deliver heavy news. Position can be uh, mountaintop experiences too, right? It can be in your boss's office when you finally get that raise that you know you've been working hard for, right? It's uh, on the tee box as you hit your first hole-in-one. Anybody ever hit a hole-in-one? Man, it can happen. It can happen. It's never happened to me, but it can happen. It's at the airport when you're waiting on your kid to come back for more. Position is key to being in the right place at the right time. And the question is, how will you be used where God has you? The second point is that God speaks in low places too. Typically, when we're in those low places, you feel distance from God, right? He speaks to you in low places too. That comes from verse 2 in chapter 37. We not only have to be aware of where we are, but we have to be able to pay attention to what God has to say while you're there. And I know that's hard. That's, 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 it's, it's a hard thing to do, right, when you're going through it. Learn to listen to His voice. It is absolutely okay to be like, God, why am I here? Like, what are you doing? <laughs> now, don't be disrespectful to God, but like, it's okay to be like, what are you doing? <laughs> why am I here? What can I learn from where I am? You know the thing that I've always, uh, 100%, was the name of that song, 100%, right? Every time I ask God for something or to, to like, teach me something, He's always faithful to, to, to speak. Anybody want to argue with that? It can, like, He's always faithful to speak. The problem is, the problem is, we talk too much. Right? They say so you gotta learn to listen to God where you are. Have you ever have you ever been in a conversation with somebody and then they somebody speaks over you? When someone's speaking over you, how how easy is it to listen? Right? Yeah. So stop doing that to God, <laughs> right? Ask him the question, wait on his response, and learn to listen to his voice. He's always faithful. Third thing that we can glean from is verse 3, chapter 37. God knows. That's the whole, like, it's the basis of finding joy, right? Joy is having that, like, God knows and God cares. I can find joy in knowing that the creator of the universe knows what I'm going through. And he cares about it, right? He says, can these bones live? What's Ezekiel's response? Oh, Lord, you know, right? Listen to this. Our circumstances don't dictate our faith. Our circumstances don't dictate our faith. Lord, anybody, anybody ever prayed this? Lord, give me strength. Did he? You got through it. You're here today, Right? Lord, I need Thee every hour I need Thee. That is one of my favorite songs. That has been the cry of my heart in so many times in my life. Lord, I need Thee every hour, every minute, every second. I need Thee. I need You to step in. I need You to embrace me. Anybody know that verse? And my God will supply. How many of your needs? All, right? And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I, and I, and I, I love this. And my God will supply every need of yours according to whose riches? Is that limited? <laughs> right? 
according to His riches in glory. And there's this thing that, that when, when uh, God asked Ezekiel, can these bones live? His automatic response was, oh Lord, you know. That's, the, uh, that's just an active part of what faith looks like. He knew that God, like God knows. I can have faith in that, that he knows what he's doing. And when he says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. Faith is the ability to see how God sees it, not the way that we see through our distorted vision, right? It's, it's being able to, to, to take off our glasses and to put God's glasses on. And sometimes you have to actively do that. <laughs> Like, let, me, let, me, let me just stop looking at this situation of life through my distorted view. God, what are you doing? Give me clarity. Can these bones live? And Ezekiel's ability to off-rip, oh Lord, you know. That's faith. Believe in this. The God of heaven can and has, can and does, can and will bring dead things to life. Amen? Anybody believe in Jesus? Like, has a relationship with Jesus in the room? Right? Anybody? Right? He brought dead things to life. You were on this trajectory for this, this damnation in hell. You were dead in your trespasses. But God brings life. The fourth thing that we can glean from is that obedience leads to blessing 100% of the time. Verses 4 through 10. Obedience leads to blessing 100% of the time. I feel like I need to explain this because sometimes people get, get caught up in situations that they don't think is very much a blessing. And we can say, well, Carlos and I were talking uh, this morning. It was like, man, thank God that storm's going that way. And those people that way <laughs> are going, man, what, what's going on? I wish it would have hit this way. <laughs> From the world's perspective, obedience to our God sounds like having an overbearing God with a list of rules and laws and expectations that we have to follow to be in good standing with Him. Our, our obedience turns us into a goody two-shoe, right? Trying to make other people look bad. But that's not what obedience is. That's not the biblical definition of obedience. It's not this master and we're the slave and we have to or we're going to get it. From the biblical perspective, obedience to our God is having a loving and gracious God who does, he does have rules, he does have laws, he does have expectation, but we get to follow them and receive blessing from our Heavenly Father when we do it for His glory, not ours. When we receive blessing, it's not because of your goodness <laughs> at all. It's because of His. And if you get blessing and you say, look what I have attained because I am cool and I am awesome, well then, that's not really a blessing at all. Blessing is that which points to who provided it. Blessing. Things that God gives us that will bring honor and glory to him, the one that we owe it all to. And blessing can come in all shapes and sizes. Blessing can be getting that new job. Anybody ever, anybody ever uh, been in that position? Like you get this new job and you're like, man, what a blessing. Blessing can also be getting laid off from a job. Because that's not where he wants you to be. Remember that whole position thing? It's on purpose. Blessing can be beating cancer. But blessing can also be being diagnosed with it. Is that a hard pill to swallow? It's not easy. God, what are you doing? <laughs> Why am I here? Because it's going to place you in rooms that I'm not going to be in, that you're going to be in, and you need to represent him while you're there. And going through it, you go, man, God's good. How can you say God's good? You have cancer. It's stage four. Because he's good. Because I know this man named Jesus and I have no fear of death because I know where I'm going. I have life. I was dead, but now I have life because of him. And he's good even if I have this cancer. 
Blessing can be buying that new home, but it can also be watching that home burn to the ground. Again, is that, would that be a hard pill to swallow? Yeah, yeah. Like, God, what are you doing? Maybe he wants you to live in another neighborhood because those neighbors need to hear about Jesus. Blessing can be working your whole career, perfecting a skill, but it can also be losing our ability to perform that skill. Blessing is solely based on the perspective of who is honored and glorified by receiving it. Is it, look what I have done, or look what God has done? The, the, the story of Job would be um, a pretty disheartening one if it weren't for the perspective that we find in chapter 1 of Job, where it says, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Man, if we can get to that place in, in our walk with Jesus where we can say, man, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. John 9, 1 through 3 says this. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not this man's sin or his parents but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Man, don't forget that. <laughs> I'm, I, I've been sitting with a, with a man who has cancer ridden throughout his whole body, and he's in extreme pain. I just, he, 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 he has a relationship with Jesus, but man, it's, just, it's a lot. And he's like, why am I going through this? Well, let me tell you about this blind man. <laughs> I, it's hard for him, you know, as you're in pain. It's like, yeah, but, you know, there's, my situation's always worried, worse than the next, right? It's hard. Don't lose that perspective. The fifth point is this. God's desire is for us to know him and be led by him. Does that sound familiar? God's desire is for us to know him and be led by him, inviting our neighbors to meet and follow Jesus. That's in the remaining, remaining verses Verse 11 in chapter 37. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Verse 12, I will bring you into the land of Israel. Verse 13, you shall know that I am the Lord. Verse 14, I will put my spirit within you and you shall live. I will place you in your own land. You shall know that I am the Lord. I will do it, declares the Lord. Verse 21, I will take the people of Israel from the nations among which they have gone and will gather them from all around and bring them to their own land. Verse 22, I will make them one nation in the land. 23, I will save them. They shall be my people and I will be their God. Verse 26, I will set them in their land and multiply them. 27, I will be their God and they shall be my people. And then verse 28, nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel. The people of Israel will just lightly say it. They messed up. They didn't listen to God. Has that ever been you? Have you ever messed up because you didn't listen to God? Man, it's easy to be like, Israel's so stupid. <laughs> I've messed up and I haven't listened to God many times in my life. And sometimes he puts you in time out, right? This is where they were. But it was, a, it was a little bit different time out than sitting in a chair or sitting in the corner with our nose in it, right? It was watching their land be destroyed. It was watching them be, like, just absolutely scattered. It was watching them, uh, uh, like, watching them die, right? Because they, they messed up. They suffered consequences of them not listening to God. Because he said, this is going to happen this is going to happen. Hey, if you keep doing this, it's going to happen. Don't touch the stove. It's hot. Well, you touch the stove and now you have a burn, right? It's that. That's when we, we, we choose to, to step out of that protective barrier, right? And then there's this thing called wrath. You put yourself into it, right? 
The people of Israel put themselves into it because they, they chose to step outside of the barrier that was protecting them because of their relationship with God. God's desire is for us to know Him and be led by Him. And you may be in a place where you, like, you feel like those dry bones in that valley. You just dried up. You're dead. It may be because you're just feeling down, disconnected from the God who saved you. But, you know, it might be that you don't have a relationship with Jesus, and that's why the reality is you are dead. You are dead in your trespasses and sin. And you need Jesus to save and restore you. The good thing is that God does not leave his people in bondage. This is, the, this is the key point of all today. God does not leave people in bondage. He redeems and restores. He redeems and restores. And the good thing is, God's not moving. And he's, 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 he's right there. And all we have to do is take that act, active step forward and draw closer to him. Realize that? Even if you're going through it, all you have to do is take that active step to move toward him. Our mission is this, said it earlier, to invite our neighbors to meet and follow Jesus, right? Because, man, uh, meeting Jesus and knowing him and, and following him as he leads us on this journey called life can be a, a pretty wild ride, right? It can be a pretty wild ride. But putting our faith into a God who takes dead things and brings life to them, <laughs> it's well worth it. This is the vision that Ezekiel got to see. He got to see these dead bones come to life because of what he said. No, because of what God did, right? Will you pray with me? Lord, I thank you for the power of your word. I thank you that you left us these truths that we get to see that you made so many promises to your people. And you came through, you're coming through, and you will continue to fulfill these promises now and forever. Lord, I pray that anybody in this room that's that's in that valley that feels dried up, dead. They need you to breathe life in them. Lord, I pray that they draw close to you. I pray that they don't peel further and further away, but they draw closer to you. Give them the boldness to say, what are you doing? Why am I here? Why am I going through this? Lord, and I... I pray that you help them be quiet, be still, and listen for your voice. You will be faithful to speak. Lord, thank you that you don't leave us in bondage. But you're there to restore us and give us hope. Lord, thank you just for what you're doing in our lives, and I pray that you use us mightily this week. In Jesus' name. Amen.